All right, so um, what I'm going to do, I've already kind of briefly mentioned, is cover um, the topic of emotion. And I just want to go ahead and put this slide up here. You can write it down. There's material that will help direct you towards the topic of memory, which uh, we ended with last time. And some of this I didn't really get to. And, uh, I, and I, I did mention short-term memory and long-term memory and places um, uh, and we, we look at this, but I thought just formally I'd put it on a slide here for you to write down and, and see if you have any questions about memory before we move forward uh, to the topic of um, emotions. So what I'd like to do is um, see if there are, first of all, any questions about the topic of memory that we maybe didn't get to or something outstanding from last time. Go ahead. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, f the f forgetting. Uh, let me have you, which reminds me of something. For the exam, I want you to read the section on forgetting, but we're not going to spend as much time there because we, we've talked some about it. Forgetting is a, is a, a process that uh, our brains seem to use to both not only hold on to information that is necessary, but there's some way in which there's some decision making going on that may, that's maybe at a level that we're not even aware of, and things get kind of either misplaced and then forgotten. Sometimes we have something there, we just can't pull it out, right? There's retrieval forgetting and errors. Sometimes there's trauma and injury that which cause people to forget things. And so they will not store a memory properly and uh, due to maybe some injury or trauma or things that they had stored seems to kind of like poof, go away. And so there is some things that we could do effortfully to forget and there's some things that just happen. So um, I guess it, it happens in, in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it just, uh, we, we honestly go back to what's called the idea of how we put memories in, we just don't store them. Uh, we just don't think about things like the seven dwarfs, their name. Sometimes you listen to them and then you forgot them. And that isn't necessarily due to bad brains or not being able to remember, but it just simply means that we just didn't store it over time. And so we, we don't recall it well. So um, read that section, but. Okay. How about stress? How does it affect memory? Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about stress. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna talk a lot about stress in about a week, week and a half. So let's save it for there because it does have some connections to memories and I'll bring it up then, how's that? Because I wanna cover that whole topic with a little bit more detail. Huh? We ready? <laughs> All right. Here we go then. Here's where I'd like to go today. And I want to talk about the topic of emotions. There's a very interesting phenomenon with emotions and it's going to center ready. One of the key things we're going to focus on today with emotions is your face. Your face and my face and the role faces play in emotions. So let's start with this. By the way, faces are the guides for us that tell us the emotion a person is experiencing, and you, bottom line, one of the cool things that psychologists who study emotion have learned is that you, without consciously being aware of it, you mimic the face of somebody else that you're in their presence you're in the presence of somebody and you, without thinking, mimic their face. You put their face on your face. Somebody tell me why that is important or the consequences of us, without even thinking, putting the face of somebody else, their face, and by the way, when I say their face, I mean the emotions on their face, the, the maybe slight hint of disgust that you might see in them or the slight, slight feeling of happiness or maybe they're just, um, feeling this kind of overwhelming, you know, even joy, and it's, it's, not, it's hard not to imitate their face. Why is that so important? Go ahead, John. It, d d does putting on somebody else's face help you read that person? See, here's the weird part. It is exactly what's necessary for people to have a conversation with somebody else, is that we do this and we read them by putting their face on our face. You know, by the way, how important we've realized this is, is there's a group of people who have gotten Botox injections in their face. How many know what Botox or you've heard of that? Why does somebody get an injection of Botox into their face? It's to stop maybe the aging process and they get, it helps their wrinkles. Botox works, ready? It works by numbing 
slightly paralyzing the muscles in the face. In doing so, when you slightly paralyze the muscle up here in this part of the face, what it does is, for some reason, wrinkles seem to kind of start to fade a little bit and go away, but there's a consequence to it. Ready? Your face uses a large number of muscles to make an emotion. And we make an emotion on our face when we see somebody else's emotion on their face. And so guess what happens to people who have had Botox injections and their ability to read the emotion of the person they're with? Do you think it helps or is hurt? It's harmed because their facial expressions are in some ways paralyzed or unable to duplicate that. And they're off like this. They say they're just kind of off. In fact, they'll oftentimes say their emotional life has been impacted and, and it's like weird, they feel a little bit, quote, muted. Almost like they're just kind of missing something, like they're not experiencing an emotion. And so for Botox, one of the things they've done is to realize, ha, huh, we're deadening an, um, a muscle in a face that is used tremendously for us because there's a thing called the facial feedback hypothesis that our brains use it reads your face, your brain reads your face to tell you what to feel and what you're doing. It's called the facial feedback hypothesis. So when you imitate somebody else's face, it goes directly to your brain and you're able to go like this, I sense or feel that this person is not happy or is sad and you can catch their emotion because your face is doing that. People with the Botox injections have a difficult time doing that. Isn't that weird? And you think, well, what, what, what does that have to do with anything? I'm not getting Botox. How can I use this? There's way cool implications for this. Your ability to read a face comes down to how good you are and read emotions and be good at this <laughs> by the ability that we have naturally and built in and then some of the things we've learned. And so I'm gonna tell you about some of these things we learned. How many emotions are there? How about Jesus and emotions? Who's the person in the top right? She was a gymnast for the uh, US Olympic team. What emotion is she showing in the top right up there? It's interesting, I'm gonna ask you all these questions and you're gonna be able to tell me, but to be get started, I, I guess I can just say that when we talk about this, the psychology of emotions and what emotions are, here's the thing, they are the heart and soul of our human life. If I asked you if you, if you had to live for 24 hours and, and you had a magic wand and you could take away your emotions, and you had no emotional feelings or reactions or perceptions of somebody else, what would life be like for you for 24 hours? You'd be dangerous to begin with. Because certain emotions keep you from doing some things. You wouldn't read situations very well and you would probably do things in retrospect that you would never do because you have emotions. You wouldn't feel guilt, imagine that. What would that be like to go out throughout a day and do something and not feel anger or guilt or embarrassment or pride or shame or envy or happiness? If you didn't have fear, this, imagine the things you might do because you weren't afraid. They took, this is one of the most, ready? Very disturbing video I'm about to show you. Yes. <laughs> That's a disturbing face you just made. Don't do that. No, not really. It's a disturbing video only in the sense of the consequences of what they just did. And I don't know if my audio is going to show up. If it doesn't, it, 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 you don't necessarily need it. I don't think in this particular video we'll see if it does. Ready? They took moms and they said, I want you to make a still face. How many have ever heard of the still face experiments? S-T-I-L-L. -L. It's a still face. And they said, basically, make no emotion whatsoever as you interact with your one-year-old baby. Does that sound cruel? Yes. It's not, it's science. <laughs> <laughs> because they only did it for just a little bit of time. And they said, moms, we want you now ready, ah, put on a still face for a short amount of time. Predict for me how babies react who are sitting there talking with mom or dad 
and they're going back and forth. Bah, 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 bah. Oh, I'm a good Z baby. Bah, bah, bah. And they talk like this. <gasps> oh, oh, baby, yeah, bah, bah. And the mom said, and now we say, ready, start the still face. How do the babies react? Do they like it? Do they think, this is awesome. I wish she was always like that. <laughs> it's probably one of the most shocking reactions they have found in a research study. This is something that we started studying about 34 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this, and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points. All right, once you start predicting, what's that baby going to do? And you see this baby is starting to make, Mom, what are you doing? Oh, look, Mom, over there. And the mom is supposed to just stay this way. So watch. Two minutes is all they're doing. Normal reaction. They react with negative emotions. They turn away. They feel the stress. They actually lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay, mom, don't ever do that to me again. The troubling part about this video is because what it demonstrates, and by the way, there are some times in which babies that might find this more of their reality than not. You see, there's something deeply powerful about how and why emotions are so central and important. They're like literally what I said, the heart and soul of our human existence. They are. You take them away, if I don't read your face or you give me that still face at a time in which I'm supposed to be getting things from you, it could be very troubling, even for this baby. It's like, oh my gosh, scary, wasn't it, to watch that? Almost like, so. How can we use knowledge like that? Well, the information that we ga gather from experiments, that they've gathered from experiments like that is to say, what role does the face make in, in us understanding and processing and knowing emotions? How do we just naturally do something like this? So let's start with some, we have to start with some very basic questions and I'll start with one, um, how many emotions? Let's start with, um, give me the, what we, what, an emotion we will see, and I'll tell you why I'm doing this one, an emotion you will see on a face. So for example, I'm not going to just see guilt on your face. There's, there's body language I might read with guilt, but give me an emotion I can read on your face. Just give me one. Anger. Anger. These are called the primary emotions. Sadness. sadness. So anger, sadness, happiness. Anger, sadness, happiness. Disgust. Uh, fear. Worry is what it would be a shorter version, uh, not as intense. Of fear. Confusion would be over here, not on, not there. Maybe a little bit, but it, it's a mixed emotion. I'll tell you in a minute. And surprise. Is that what you're going to get? No, what was the one you were going to say? 
excitement would be, yeah, it's, excitement depends on if it's happy excitement or excited some weird thing going on. It's kind of like happiness, sort of, maybe, and surprise. Okay, six emotions. We find them on the face, and we call those universal for a reason. They're universal and they're primary because that baby seems to be able to show all of those emotions on their face regardless of the culture they're in and ready universally every culture we go to and they've taken cameras to all these remote places that have no access to other cultures for example and they take a video camera and they ask them to show emotions and guess what they do smiling happiness sorry is always followed or, or shown by smiling. That's kind of reassuring, isn't it? Because if maybe, maybe they were smiling and they made that face like, oh, I'm gonna kill you, and they're like, I'm so happy. <laughs> that would be odd. But they're primary because we seem to find happiness is rated this way and fear shows up in the same face, and so we call that universal when the face looks just like somebody else's face, when they're being afraid in all cultures. By the way, you don't have to write the rest of this down. It's just a, 600 words in, in English to describe emotions. There's a rich complexity to humans' emotional lives, a rich complexity that's represented just to, even in Eng, the English language, the, the words there. There are, there are words in other languages, for example, that we don't have in the English language that are very nuanced about certain emotions. And then some even in words that we would say are pretty easy don't, sometimes don't even show up in other languages. So especially when you start mixing emotions, confusion, embarrassment, those are odd, what we call secondary or mixed emotions. By the way, the muscles, 42 of them. That complexity and that number of muscles just in your face that are used to express an emotion is why you're so good at this and why that baby responded so negatively because his whole life, that's all he saw were these emotions and he could read his mom and know what his mom was thinking and feel what his mom was feeling and feel a sense of attachment. And all of a sudden, those 42 motion, uh, uh, muscles went still and his experience altered significantly. So we use these in a lot of ways. By the way, um, we take babies, you don't have to write this down either, but you put this little, uh, what's called a sensor disc on them, and you could read, it doesn't hurt him as you might, as you can tell, but that we could now stick this on people and read certain emotions from the brain that correlate with like, for example, facial expressions. This one is designed specifically for a baby, but we can see what's here, brain impulses, neural brain impulses in a variety of things. Neonatal ICUs and sleep labs, because it's pretty easy, but it starts to show us correlates, brain correlates of certain emotional expressions, and then we can start to see and read at a better level. So that's just one cool little thing that they use out there in a variety of places to try and read what happens when a person is experiencing a, a thought, an idea, or an emotion, and then what's the relationship with some of the brain patterns that are going on. What's that emotion on that face? Let's see how good you are. Happy. I gave you six, so you, how many say that's happiness? Well, okay, it's happiness. <laughs> Hmm. What's that one? Sadness. Sadness. Good. What's that one? Anger. Ooh, anger. By the way, of these six emotions, one of them is missed 70% of the time by adolescents. 13, 14, and 15-year-olds oftentimes are going to find one of these six emotions that they miss, and I want you to tell me which one it is. They don't read it. They misidentify it. So ready? That one you said was? Anger, you said. Surprise. Well, how do you know it's surprise? The eyebrows are, are a big clue. The size, when, when, she, when a person opens up their eyes and lifts their eyebrows and their mouth stays like that, it kind of tells us, oh, uh-oh, something's going on here. All right, so surprise. What's that one? The eyebrows are up, but the mouth drops down and the eyebrows close in, pinch a little bit, and we would say that one's fear. And then this one? Disgust. Yeah, not both eyebrows oftentimes might be at a, but, but the, the face, the mouth in particular tells that this one's disgust. 
Do you all get them? Which one of these do uh, teenagers most often misidentify? I've heard everyone. Anger, fear, not happiness. Didn't hear that one. The emotion most misidentified, and I'll show you a video clip of this one, is fear. They almost always go like this. Oh, 15 to 14 year olds will go like this. They put them in MRIs and whatever, and we show them this, and they, or whatever, we just do experiments with them, and they go, oh, they're, they're really angry. That's what they'll say oftentimes. Oh, they seem really surprised. What does that mean if 14 and 15 year olds misidentify the, fa the fear face in people? You think about the consequences of that, and, th and think about it. Six emotions. Those are the primary ones. Those, th that we call those primary because they are universal. We see them on the face. Most cultures show these same facial expressions in association with these same emotions. So we call those universal or primary emotions, all right? So those are the six. They're, they're, sometimes people put on a different emotion or they add seven or eight or nine or some like to narrow it down to four or five, whatever, but you know, this is kind of close enough to what we call primary. Secondary emotions, what's that emotion? <laughs> it's the movie called Home Alone, but what's the emotion he's showing? <laughs> that, is, that like, is that fear and what? Surprise? Yeah. Like, oh, I'm about to die or whatever. I don't know. This might be awe, fear and surprise is sometimes, when you put fear together, ready? Make a fear face <gasps> and a surprise face, <gasps> it's awe. <laughs> okay, so let's try another one. What faces are these people showing? It's a combination of two. We, we probably see a little bit of disgust. Yeah, it's maybe anger. That was good. We call that contempt. If somebody disgusts you, you might be angry with them and you might feel contempt toward them. What, what emotion is that one? There's two. It's certainly what? Does it look like anger and maybe sadness? We call that what? Somebody's both angry and sad at the same time. We call it remorse. Maybe this is more like, instead of anger, some, maybe it's more like disgust and sadness. So you can see there's variations and little subtleties, but we read faces pretty well and we see this and we go, oh, there's something he's talking about. And you have to know the context and maybe listen to what he's saying and go, ah, he's expressing some sort of remorse. Doesn't like something and he's sad about it and we would say that. So it gets difficult because you could add in even third layers and it Add in a different emotion and it, the context will come into play. So that's primary versus secondary. Questions? All right, so now we, you can see how hard this is. We gotta start coming up with certain emotions and sometimes we mix these emotions and it's very difficult, but we almost always find people in different cultures say they like certain emotions and they dislike, they're unpleasant. So what are the pleasant ones? Happy. Happiness, she's happy, and people like to be happy. They call that pleasant. Give me, an, give me an emotion that they would call almost universally unhappy or unpleasant. Sad. Yeah, to be fearful, uh, uh, angry, uh, they, they, people say I, that's an unpleasant emotion. By the way, disgust is an unpleasant emotion. People don't like being disgusted. I'm gonna show you a videotape of us, me disgusting people and some people being disgusted and then I'll show you that real quick. By the way, this picture was taken because a guy was looking at the teeth of a man who fell asleep while sitting on a tree, under a tree, in this place, and as he fell asleep, his mouth was open, and some, a bug came in, and he, uh, this flesh fly crawled and deposited its larvae inside the gaps of the man's teeth. Isn't that great? I'll turn it off so it's not disgusting. Oh, wait. <laughs> this thing's messed up, it keeps showing. I'm sorry, I can't turn it off. So you can see his face. Some of you are like looking disgusted like, hold on, it won't go off. You don't have to write that down. Disgust comes into play. 
on our faces, ready, unpleasant. Oh, by the way, this one's unpleasant too. And I hesitate doing this one. And you know what, I'm not going to because it won't work anyway. Yes, thank you. I can't do it, you know why? Because I don't have any audio. So it's just some of you want to try it, you get the, oh, wait. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. If it does work, we'll try it. There are like different ways you can try and see what emotions uh, are brought up by people and how they feel about them and how this kind of comes into play with um, certain kinds of emotions that we experience, but they show up on faces. Yeah, okay, we'll just skip it. Um, but if you've seen the car, there's a car commercial. I mean, how many of y'all seen that and it causes people to be a little bit scared? How many have seen that commercial? Because it's just this really cool, okay, I'll try it. I don't know if it'll work. Let's give it a shot. Okay, you have to watch it. I don't think it's gonna work. Just watch this cool car commercial, shh. Didn't work very well. Okay, whatever. Sorry, I scared somebody over here. Wow. That was, that was Randy who screamed like crazy. Emotions on faces. Who was that? Was that you? Um, Sometimes when we, when we express emotions or we feel an emotion or we feel its intensity or we don't like it like fear, there are ways that certain places and certain people will express that like, a, like screaming or, at, but ready? In many cultures we say this, there are some emotions that are appropriate and some that are not. I grew up in a, some of you are in a home. How many grew up in a home would you say that kind of emotions were like, you, you try not to express them too strongly, too deeply. Every, like you tried to keep it light, nice and settled. You got happy, that was great, but you didn't yell and scream a lot. And you didn't show a whole lot of emotions. How many were kind of raised in a, in a situation, family like that? And how many were like just the opposite? You, you could like express emotions deeply and loudly and, uh-huh. Sometimes our, views about the expression of emotions are very much impacted by our families and our cultures. I had a friend who uh, just happened to be in a particular, <laughs> of, uh, in, a, in, a, in his family, you could express emotions in amazing ways. I could never do what he did, but I was over at his house playing and I still remember this. He's my best friend growing up. And, uh, and he, he got home one day and we were sitting there and his mom started telling him something and I kind of was a little bit used to it, but he just yelled at her. Like, no, mom, that's Stu, I'm not doing that, that's Benji's job, he's supposed to do that. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's dead. <laughs> he just yelled in a, in, to his mom and then here comes the dad walk, what's going on here? And then, and I think, oh, he's dead. I don't think I'm not going to be spending the night. Everything's ruined. And now he starts yelling at the dad. And the dad yells at him. And then they yell at the mom. And then they both yell back at each other. I'm going, dear Lord, what happened? <laughs> and that was just their normal. And then they sat down and we ate dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I went home. I said, Mom, what's wrong with this family? She goes, ah, uh, that's... Let me tell you a little bit about just differences. That's just the way it, that family, they, they'd scream and yell. I kind of liked it too. It was fun to, <laughs> to participate in that. And, uh, but we all, we're all different, right? Sometimes, and when you get married, you're gonna find somebody who might come from a different background with emotional intensity. And so my wife does this. She is just, she gets excited about anything. If you call her up and say, guess what, I've been thinking about a job and I finally got it, she'd be, yay, she'd be jumping on the phone with you. And so she just, that's, she just kind of lets this out. And I'm more like calm and reserved. So my kids popped out of the womb and I went, oh, that's pretty cool, I'm glad. <laughs> I mean, they, I looked at their toes and their fingers and they were 10, I went, I'm, I'm good, I'm happy. But see, my wife didn't get freaked out, like what is wrong with this robot? She knew to, be, to expect that because I'm pretty what, much, it's just kind of like that. And, and I'm good, I'm happy. I remember this university called me and offered me a job. And she was on the other line. 
And she's sitting there listening, and that guy goes, hey, we'd like to offer you the job, and would you like to come out and be a professor here? And I'm like, yeah, let me think about it and pray about it. And she's over there bouncing like Tigger, you know? Like, <laughs> and she's so happy, and I, I say, okay, I'll talk to you later, bye, and hung up, and she's jumped, like, aren't you excited? And I'm like, yeah, it'll be fine, I'll, talk, I'll think about it. And she's like, what's wrong with you? Isn't this happy? And I'm like, no, no, I'm happy, yeah, this is me. <laughs> it's a little bit weird, or not. We're consistent, but sometimes our training and our background and who we are and our personalities come into play. But there are emotions that show up on people that are sometimes different, we're felt in a different level, and then there are emotions that we all kind of have and know about, but that are kind of of a unique category called self-conscious emotions. A self, anybody know a self-conscious emotion? Something that requires you to think about it or process it or it's related to some processing. And by the way, that baby that you saw in the still face probably doesn't, it was too young to experience a self-conscious emotion. What's an emotion that baby was too young to experience? Wow, would that baby that you saw earlier ex be able to experience guilt? By the way, if you ever have a baby and you hang out with them or you work with them or you're in, you know, I don't know, daycare with them or whatever in a nursery and you're working with a kid that's one year of age and walking around, my guess is you're gonna, be, you're gonna realize they don't really experience guilt. They really don't care. They don't experience things like embarrassment. I come home, my kids at that age, they were like naked, running around outside, they didn't care. They just ran around, had, they enjoyed things, and it was weird, but to say they didn't experience guilt or shame or embarrassment or pride or envy or jealousy is an odd thing, and we call these odd things self-conscious emotions because they don't, first of all, they don't show up on the face. We have a hard time seeing a facial expression of one of these self-conscious emotions, like pride or embarrassment or shame, and besides being triggered, that's why they're called self-conscious emotions, they're triggered by mental reflection, they tend not to develop until the child's about two years of age. And that is interesting. And what it means is there's probably something that's occurring developmentally in children that occurs, you remember we talked about babies at around 18 months give or take, start to remember, not remember, but they know that they are different or that they are from, from the, that they are a self, a, they have self-awareness, so they see a reflection in the mirror before the age of, you know, let's say a year, and they don't know that that's, they think it's somebody else. But by around 18 months, they begin to understand that that image in the mirror is them. At the same time, they start to use things like I, words like I and me and mine. They become self-aware. And it's at the time they start to go, oh, like a kid at 18 months will go like this. For the first time, you'll hear this phrase, this little almost word with 18 months old, and, and it's always a, a scary moment for a parent. And it's this one, uh-oh. <laughs> And that means there's a good in life and there's a bad in life, and that's bad. <laughs> so I, I might get a come to me, uh-oh. And I'll say, uh-oh, uh-oh, what? Uh-oh. And I usually go to the toilet to see what he just flushed. <laughs> like, oh, the remote control. That's a uh-oh, all right. That's uh-oh. Don't do that. That look, it's bad. Uh-oh, no oh. <laughs> And he's like, but see, he's like young, and they're like, I, you know, to, to discipline the kid at that point would be, they don't really understand. But uh-oh starts to, for me to tell, it starts to tell me, oh, there's a good and a bad. They'll bring up a, you know, like a doll that has no head on it, and they'll look to an adult and go, uh-oh, uh-oh. There's good, and then there's this, uh-oh. And you're like, oh, you're getting good and bad. They're starting to get the self-conscious, self-awareness of knowing good from bad and knowing, ah, but it's only then that they start to, think, start to say things like, oh, like my kids were like, I don't know, maybe four or five before they even thought to be embarrassed about being naked. 
Someone would come over and they'd be running around like, put clothes on them, please. And they'd be like, they, they didn't care. But around five or six, like, we noticed a weird change. They're like, oh, you can't see me. Like, why? And then I go, oh, you're starting. So these things come in increments and in times, and they depend upon self-reflection. Self-conscious emotions are weird. How about Jesus and emotions? That's a great topic. Right now, tell me emotions that Jesus experienced. If we looked in, and read some uh, passages in the New Testament, which some of you have no doubt recently read about, and you're wondering what emotion it, could, can we identify that he experienced? It was, it, Jesus experienced anger. Probably could point to places like interacting with some of his disciples and other places, and he got angry with them and the Pharisees, huh? And in the temple. Oh, Jesus experienced fear. I, I want, let's hold on to that one. And I, where do you think he, where, in where part? In the garden before, the night before he was crucified. He sh yeah, he, he, there was a prayer recorded that said, Lord, uh, take this cup from me. I, I don't want to go through what's about to happen. And, and uh, he, he showed d certainly signs of distress, right? Ooh, do you think Jesus was afraid at that time? I want you to think about that question. Give me another emotion. Sadness. Sadness. He was sad when? Were you going to say that one? Lazarus. At the death of a friend of his, he went and he saw this guy named Lazarus, and all his brothers and sisters came to him and said, if you had been here, Jesus, he wouldn't have died. And it freaked him out. The, the, the people around were freaked out and scared and sad, and he saw that. And then the famous short verse, right, in John 11, 35, it says Jesus wept. Sadness, he was anger, maybe. Uh, well, tell you what, he probably experienced most emotions, but do you think he experienced any self-conscious emotions? Uh, okay, one more time. Do you think Jesus ever experienced guilt as an emotion? Was he ever ashamed? Uh, do you think Jesus is ever in, so, so far we wouldn't, guilt, shame, embarrassment, pride, not, not godly pride of, you know, something that, you know, but, um, or godly jealousy, but envy, pride, jealous of another human. like the shamefulness of all that stuff when he was uh-huh okay so oh, here's this maybe let's try this the, the the question could be did jesus experience all emotions how about if we said while he was human and walked on this earth that makes sense yeah. not hanging on the cross because i think what you brought up is that he he took all of our shame guilt on him when he hung on the cross is that right would that be right yeah, yeah seems like it so while he walked the earth, do you think he experienced any self-conscious emotions? But isn't it also, it's like also embarrassing how he was almost new, almost. Okay, could he, and he was on the cross at that point. So when he was walking on the earth, did he experience these? How about, okay, somebody said anger, joy, disgust, sadness. I don't know about, by the way, surprise and fear. I'll let you think about it. Was he ever, was he ever like, by fear, would, would, would Jesus have ever went like this? Oh, he didn't know what was coming and it scared him. I don't know. By the way, just as an, an interesting thing, um, one of the most common emotions that humans expressed and express, continue to express, for example, if there's ever a supernatural or spiritual event or a, a being, like in the, in the Old and New Testament, when we say like an angel comes down or God comes down, what's the first human response of emotion? It's fear. And what's almost always, every time like, like somebody would you know, express an emotion of fear, how would oftentimes even Jesus respond to the emotion of fear in people? He almost always, yeah, he said, do not fear. In fact, ready, we recorded the phrase, do not fear, 365 times. One for every single day. Do not fear was said by God, Jesus, angels, prophets, and apostles to humans. And it's found in the Bible 365 times. I think that's interesting. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. 
don't be anxious, don't look about you. And I, I, I do wonder sometimes as I read it, I don't know, maybe you find instances of Jesus being afraid, the garden is one, is a possibility. Did somebody else have a thought, question on this? Just an interesting thought experiment, something to look at. The most common command in scripture though is do not fear, I think that's interesting. Was Jesus surprised when the woman touched the hem of his robe? And was, was Jesus ever surprised, like, oh, I did not know that was coming. The woman touches the hem of his robe, and he turns and says to her, who touched my robe, right? Who touched me? I felt the power, I don't know, flow out of me, whatever. Right, is that what he said? Uh-huh. Or he saw one of his disciples, and they made a statement, or uh, actually someone who he's healing their, uh, wanted to heal their daughter, and this person surprised him by what he said. At least that's maybe the possibility. I don't know, it's a good thought. Well, just something to think about, yeah. Maybe when he was a little kid. Yeah, maybe when he was little. We don't know. We don't have a lot, whole lot of you know, things written down about that when he was little, and so it could be at that time too. Well, just something to think about. Um, but let's transition now to something that will be a little bit more um, related to the question what emotions are. <laughs> emotions, emotions are made up of a variety of things. We've already talked about the face. There is certainly something about our face and emotions. In fact, we could say it this way. Emotions involve a mixture of three components. These three components are going, I'm gonna just put them up real quickly. Physiological arousal is one. So for some people, an emotion begins because or, or is occurring, and as this emotion is occurring, they feel it in their, in their bodies, right? They simply know it's happening, they're aware that it's happening, and it's their body that tells them that, sometimes in a way that begins a process of them beginning to either run away, because this emotion of being afraid says, oh, get ready and run, we call that fight or flight. And the symptom, by the way, the sympathetic nervous system, uh, the sympathetic nervous system gives us these reactions. Our, Pupils dilate, uh, the skin perspires, your heart accelerates, and, and you, your adrenal gland pumps out uh, stress hormone. This is in your textbook. So the sympathetic goes like this. Ah, oh, it's a scary uh, tiger. And then your parasympathetic calms you out. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was just a small cat. And so you just go like you, you, the sympathetic and then the parasympathetic work together, but that physiological arousal is what you will sometimes, when you have an emotion, you'll, you'll experience that in a deep way. How many have experienced in the last couple of days a pretty intense emotion? Let me see your hands. If over the last few days you've experienced a pretty intense emotion. Huh, uh-huh. How many like in the last few days haven't experienced an intense emotion? Let me see if you haven't. If you're like, no, I just I haven't really had one. Okay, give me the intense emotion that some of you have experienced. What, what was it? If you, want to, if you don't have to share it, but, yeah? Uh -huh. um, I was driving on the freeway and my mom's car and her horn doesn't work and somebody was about to hit me and hit me anything. Oh, okay, so the emotion was? I was gonna die. Okay, there. <laughs> <laughs> she felt she was going to die, she was on the freeway, horn didn't work and somebody was, okay. So it was like a scary, fearful moment, uh-huh. That emotion, that intensity, if that car commercial had worked and it was really loud, some of you may have screamed, <laughs> like some of you did, and that would be the sympathetic nervous system, and we call this the fuel or the tingle, and that's the, by the way, this hormonal reaction that we have, and that hormonal reaction that some people feel during intense emotions um, is, is quite possibly um, something like epinephrine or norepinephrine. This is the tingle that's associated with an intense emotion that some of you might know about. That tingle, that feel, that kind of, you, you know your body is, it, it's, a, it's a, some people kind of tense up like this, or, they, or some people cry in intensity. How many of you are criers? You're like, emotions and you, and you tend to cry. Oh, good. All right. So crying, uh, by the way, which is interesting because we find in tears, we find a stress hormone, like the adrenal hormones, in, in, in tears that come out. So it's interesting that when people experience 
like stress or heavy emotions, it does seem like the like it's a cleansing out process sometimes, and it's fascinating to find that. So that's the, that's the hormonal reaction, all right? So far, so good, questions? Epinephrine, remember we talked about this particular, it's both the works at this level and it influences our, re, our reactions, especially as the sympathetic pays attention and sets us up to fight or to flee. There's also an, uh, an emotion that involves, emotions involve not only this physiology, but also a conscious experience. So we have subjective feelings. And these feelings could be things that we either like that or don't like it. So if you're, how many like to get scared? Like if you're on a, you, how many like to be afraid or scared like on a ride or Halloween, whatever you scare people? Some of you like that. How many don't like to be scared? And, yeah, it's a good percentage. Um, we say, well, I like this or I don't like that. And that, this subjective feeling makes up this conscious part. So an emotion is, ready? The tingle of the emotion, the, the feeling of it. And it's also this like or dislike. So let me show you disgust real quick. And, and most people don't like to be disgusted. We have a curiosity about it. If I say to you, here's something in this little bottle that smells disgusting, often you say, can I smell it? And then you smell it and say, ooh, it's disgusting. I mean, why did you even want to smell it? <laughs> Paul Rosin has spent 20 years disgusting people. He's been investigating how thoughts and emotions become linked as we grow up. Disgust seems to be about food, and it's about the mouth, the disgust face is around the mouth. And yet I realized pretty early that most of the examples of disgust that we ran into were not about food. There's a, a disgust at touching things that are dead, the disgust at seeing blood or gore. People would say certain kinds of unnatural sex is disgusting. People would say that certain people were disgusting. So the question is, what was the relation between the original food core of disgust and all these other things. <laughs> it's been a dirty business involving a range of unsuspecting victims and lots of messy foods. Put some ketchup on it. See, like that. Now, how would you like to have that? No. I eat banana. Anyone with children knows how quickly they learn what they do and don't like to eat. I want to eat that. Would you like to eat that? By three or four, they've learned there's a basic distinction between food and things that shouldn't be eaten. Crayon? No, that's from drawing. Would you like to lick it even? No. How about touching it? No? No. You know what that is? A poopy. That's a, that's a, that's a doggy poopy. Would you like to eat that? No. You don't want to eat it? It's yucky. Would you, would you touch it? No. Would you eat it? No. Little Cleo, at 14 months, will try anything once. She will only reject things if they taste bad. And since this is chocolate fudge, she's not going to learn that lesson today. So for a, for a one-year-old child who will eat virtually anything in its way, food is just uh, something that's a lump out there that you can taste. And it's not really. Depending on whether it tastes good. For a three-year-old already, there's some things that just are not to be eaten. They're not because of their taste only. They seem just inappropriate and offensive. So within a few years, disgust is felt, not just because something tastes bad, but because of more sophisticated ideas we've acquired. For Rosin, one key landmark is the emergence of the concept of contamination. You know what that is? A bug, and I don't want it. <laughs> it's a cockroach. And I'm going to put it on this little spoon and drop it in your juice over there. Um, maybe stir it around a little. I'm going to stir it around a little. I'm not going to eat that. Most of us would, would you eat, would you drink the juice if the bug, if you took the bug out? Now, mo no, no, a few people in this room would, some of you would, would like to, I don't know why, but you would do it. <laughs> would this little boy in the picture want to do that? Would he do it? Predict what will happen. Is he old? What? So the question was this. Is there a time and when, by the way, I did this with my children when they were like three or four. 
What do you think they did? They said, uh, can you take the bug out? And then what did they do? Yeah. Are you going to eat that? No. Why not? Because it's Would you drink some of that apple juice? Yeah, but I can't drink the bug. You don't want to drink that juice? But I don't want to drink the bug. OK, now suppose I take the cockroach out of the juice. It's pretty easy to identify with the idea that the juice has been contaminated. But we're not born with ideas like that. So when does this association develop? By seven years of age, as we saw with Richard, the juice is still bad after the cockroach is gone. He has a much higher cognitive level of, perception, of perceiving the situation. He is seeing this as the history of the juice. Something was left in the juice, even though it's invisible. Okay, well, watch now. The thought of the cockroach seems to confuse slightly younger children. At four, Zach is not keen, and he takes a bit of persuading. I taste it. Sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> Though they would not eat the cockroach, they found it offensive. They, they were happy to drink the juice after the cockroach was removed. So they still don't have a sense of contamination. They're putting on the plate. Now, we'll get, how about drinking the apple juice now? Okay. To an adult, <laughs> what Eli's doing is disgusting. Now, this is a... All right. So what it happens for us, that whole idea of that is, it really is, it's disgusting for us, right? We don't want that. We think that's not a good thing to do. We find it... Um, something that arouses in us a subjective feeling, and, and, and that, that's something we learn over time. Some things, some foods disgust us that other people would be like, oh man, that's great stuff to eat, right? And we think it's different. So there's an appraisal of events. By the way, emotions have this sort of appraisal to it that comes into play. Um, and what we do is we make interpretations based upon some of these backgrounds, and we go like, we say, um, our experience of an emotion depends not just on this, this you know, physiology, this physiological arousal, but how we interpret something. So we've actually had people who will, you could change an emotion immediately. I, I, I think I've used this example before. If you're walking down the street and somebody trips you, they stick out a stick and you're walking down camera and they trip you, you're, you can get very angry. Someone just tripped me, why would they do that? But if you found out a few seconds later that it was just a, a person who was visually impaired and they're walking down the street and they stuck their stick out and they're to walk, you, your anger would go away, your interpretation would change. So all that has to say is our perceptions are very important in this. And let me show you an experiment in which they tried something pretty cool. What they did was they took people um, and they, injected them with something like epinephrine, an amphetamine type, like caffeine sort of. And their hearts began to race, okay? In these certain cases, what they did is their interpretation and perception was different if they were told, you're about to get an injection and it has this in it and this, and so you're going to kind of start to have this reaction. Their reaction and in perception and interpretation was different than if the person was told, you are getting an injection of, let's say, salt water or sugar or a placebo. And so they all volunteered to be part of this experiment and it was very interesting how they decided about the event depending upon what they were told and so their perceptions varied. And here's that idea of interpretation influencing an emotion. We know that we can influence the way we feel by deliberately changing our brain chemistry. We do it all the time with drugs such as coffee, nicotine, and alcohol. Here in Chicago, one scientist has been experimenting with drugs. Drugs serve a very useful function in the study of emotion because they stimulate the very system that's uh, activated in a natural situation when people go through an emotional situation. So they, we can use them as a tool to stimulate the limbic system. Harriet DeWitt has devised a cunning experiment to test the effects of one drug, a stimulant, amphetamine. 
Two of the volunteers are told they've been given an inactive placebo pill. The other two, that they've been given a stimulant. In fact, all four have taken a dose of amphetamine. Drugs like amphetamine work by mimicking natural biochemicals in the brain. So if changes in biochemistry are all there is to experiencing an emotion, all the subjects should feel the same, whether they know they've taken a drug or not. Half an hour into the experiment, and the amphetamine begins to take effect. All the subjects will be experiencing an overall increase in arousal. They become restless. Tim and Ryan know they've taken a stimulant and are out of their seats already. But how will the unsuspecting Brooke and Mike react? We saw quite clearly that the people who were expecting to receive a placebo interpreted the sensations that they experienced quite differently and they experienced them in a more negative way. They felt uh, jittery, they felt anxious, they didn't enjoy the experience. And in contrast, the people who knew that they were going to get a stimulant drug uh, recognized and identified the, the sensations that they experienced as being due to the drug, and they actually enjoyed the drug effect. They felt energized, they felt focused, they talked more, they were amusing, so <laughs> their behavior was really quite different, and their, their, each of their experiences of the effects of the drug were quite different, just simply depending on what they were expecting to receive. I, I'm a Gemini, born June 4th, 1975. I am single. I found a pebble on the floor, which has caught my interest. Their different responses reveal a great deal about the way subjective feeling is processed in the brain. I'm trying to flick it up on my foot like a football. I think it tells us that the basic uh, uh, physiological responses that are involved in, in emotion uh, are really only a part of the emotion. And, and what makes the experience that we describe as an anxious emotion or a positive emotion is, is, is very strongly influenced by the person's understanding of the situation and the person's interpretation of the situation. All right. So our emotions depend on how we feel about how we interpret something, right? Some people will interpret what we're experiencing one way, and another person a different way, and that interpretation will determine oftentimes that emotion. So, and then lastly, as far as the mixture of three components, body posture is very important. So ready, I look at your face and it tells me what your emotion you're experiencing. But your body posture tells me how what? I watch your body and it tell, I know what your, your face tells me, okay, this person's happy, but your body tells me how intense it is, okay? So intensity, that person is very excited. I look at his body and I go, ah, that's an intense emotion. Even the people in the background, can you see them? They're all happy about something he just did, made a putt or whatever he did, and they're going, oh, yes. That, and so they're experiencing, so intensity shows up on the body. Face tells us the emotion, the intensity tells us. So body posture is very important for us to read. We can read depth of sadness by watching a person's body posture, for example. Okay? So, there are certain gestures people do uh, as an outer expression to tell other people they're feeling an emotion. Do you know any gestures that tell other people you're angry with them? Of course you do. You could do, and by the way, every culture has an angry expression. And I could probably show you how, I could flip you off in like 15 languages. <laughs> and you wouldn't even know it. But it's like this, that's a very powerful expression of I dislike you a lot in some, in some cultures. Give me another culture's expression of dislike or anger. There are some, even in, okay, we have a guest from England. For me to do this is fine. For me to do that is not so fine. Would you agree? That's a bad one. There are other ones we do. We use a certain finger, obviously, to express deep emotion. I was in the car one time with my kid who was, remember how they imitate everything you do as, at that age? And so this kid was doing, Im, imitating everything. And this person, we were driving and, and I was trying, I was like, I was this car trying to get off the freeway 
and this was this car. She was coming on and, and going like that, trying to hurry up. So I went, ah, oh, I gotta hurry. So I cut over like that, kind of beat her. And I could tell by her body posture, <laughs> she was not happy. She was very angry with me. And I saw it in the rear view mirror. She's like, blah, 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 and she did. And so she pulled up, I'm like this, and she pulled up right next to me, and my kid was in the car. I knew what she was going to do. She was just going to let me know in a certain gesture that, nah, you're a bad man. And so she did it. And my kid's like, what's that? I went, oh, no. But then I reacted in a way that I don't know why, but it was kind of fun, actually. But she did that, and I went like this. I just turned, I went, hmm, like that. <laughs> I stuck my tongue out, and her face was awesome. She was like, oh. <gasps> like, like I stuck my tongue out, and she was all mad at me. Like, ooh, that worked pretty good. Daddy, why is that lady making that face? I'm like, I don't know, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> so I do that now a lot. People are like, eh, mm, like that. <laughs> Gestures are learned ways that we use to say, I'm going to tell you what I feel or don't feel and I'm kind of angry with you. And there are a lot of different ways of using gestures. Facial expressions, we've already spent a lot of time talking about that shows up outwardly and we, we use those, the eyes in particular. Um, if I showed you a set of eyes, you could probably, if it's the right, you could probably read the emotion. So let's try it. What's that emotion? It's either fear or surprise, right? And so uh, faces, are, are, this just illustrates it, even, even in just pieces of the face, the eyes itself could be very powerful. So can tone of voice. We use tone of voice a lot to express a, a certain kind of emotion and, and we read that. You're very good reading, uh, readers of nonverbals beyond facial expressions like gestures and tone of voice. And, and there's this history that we all have with them and so we follow them. By the way, uh, like I said, it follows in a lot of different cultures. I wanna uh, just put up in the last few minutes of class here something on the theories of emotion. And there are four I want you to pay attention to. There's a common sense theory of emotion and it goes like this. When that stimulus popped up, a scary person, sorry Randy, don't scream, but there's a scary person, you, you feel, well let's ask you, what did you feel when that person popped up? Terrified. You felt terrified. And so you did what? What was your autonomic arousal? Screamed. You screamed, okay? So we would, common sense would say Randy trembled because she felt afraid, right? That was the common sense idea and we held on to that for a long time. There's something that we see, there's some sort of it, it, conscious feeling of fear and then this, our bodies sometimes react, okay? William James, I guess the founder of American psychology you can say, along with Carl Lang actually reversed it. They put forth the theory that says, actually what happens is a stimulus causes this autonomic arousal first, the body will scream, let's say, so that thing pops up, James and Lang said, actually the reason a person screams is because they were trembling or screaming. They're, in other words, the, re oh, sorry. the reason they're afraid, the reason they feel fear is because they trembled or screamed. So they reversed it. This, this probably, this theory, the James Lang theory that reversed this lasted for just a little bit of while. There was some research that's shown it's probably not this way. And so there probably is some brain things that are going on that make some of this more likely to occur, in fact, simultaneously. That is, there's this subcortical brain activity that is immediately sends out both your screaming, trembling, and your feeling of fear. We call that, uh, Walter Cannon uh, proposed this with a uh, graduate student, Bard, and they came up with this thing called the Cannon-Bard theory that basically says, that scary person that popped up made you tremble and feel afraid and it was simultaneous. 
So some theories of emotion have to kind of try and parcel this out and work at what happens and what comes first. And for some researchers, they're spending their time studying, we know how this emotion comes into play and when it happens. Probably the one that has a lot of support and, and interest out there is, is the last one I'll talk about, which is the two-factor theory, um, the Schachter two-factor theory. And basically, that uh, the, ultimately what happens is there's a cognitive appraisal. If you're looking on this screen, you'll see the word appraisal over here at the bottom. But what it means is you label your fear as, you label your trembling as a fear because you appraise the situation as dangerous or scary, but that label that you put on your trembling tells you the emotion. And so we call that particular theory of emotion that there involves this cognitive appraisal whereby you put in a label on this arousal and then you say, oh, ooh. So one time me and a friend, a couple of friends were out there and this, we were taking a picture by one of those tall cactuses in the middle of an Arizona desert and a rattlesnake was right there. We didn't know it and all of a sudden we all three, three, three or four of us, I guess we were sitting there, standing there, we heard Two of the guys ran into the car never to come back out again. It just freaked them out. So they labeled, their appraisal was, this is scary. We didn't like it there. Me and a other friend, it wasn't all that scary and, and momentarily scary, but it was more like kind of exciting and cool and whatever. So it was, we just labeled things differently, okay? That's the Schachter two-factor. So it depends, the, the ultimate, your experience of a particular emotion depends upon how you label it. They took people on a bridge and that were walking on this bridge, 270 foot high in British Columbia. And they, it was a rickety bridge, uh, really high, and it was kind of kind of moved a lot. And they interviewed a person on the bridge. And um, they found out that when they used a female interviewer to take a survey of people walking on the bridge, um, that when they compared, they said at the end, hey, if you want to know more about our study, we're just doing a quick survey, would you fill this out? Here's my name and number. If you want to know more about the study, give me a call. A lot of people on the high bridge, especially the men, called that, that woman, the female re reviewer, or the female person that was taking the survey, they called her. And they did, they du duplicated the survey and they did it on a low bridge that was only like five, 10 feet high off, you know, high off the ground and it was real stable and sturdy. She didn't get as many phone calls from the guys. Why was that? Asking her out, by the way. <laughs> Schachter, the two-factor theory says that some of those men on that bridge were labeling their emotion as what? They're up on the bridge, it's really scary, and they're moving around. Here comes this person, and they ask, can you take this quick survey? They did it, here's my phone number, and they might have labeled that <gasps> fear as what? It kind of excitement and attraction. And that mislabel could have contributed, does that make sense? Yeah. Appraisals. So, that was it. You have questions? We'll see you on uh, Wednesday. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.